Uh, echo everyone else in thanking Hector, and in fact, I think I um, probably owe more thanks to him than anything because it was uh, on his suggestion that the topic for this paper kind of arose. There was a sentence in in my book um, where I made an observation about the social construction of reality and the prevalence of language and knowledge as mechanisms of the social construction process that were emphasized there, and I said it seemed to me that sensory perception seemed um, implicit and important to explore, but 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 not very explicitly treated in the text. And Hector said, "Do you think you might want to expand on that?" It was just one sentence. You know, do you think you might want to expand on that? And so um, I subsequently reread the book with this kind of sensory sensitization um, in mind and, and tracked all the references to sensory perception in the book. You know, how it was explicitly dealt with and where it was implicitly invoked, but not really um, fully theorized. And so. This is, um, you know, just kind of a brief overview of what I, what I, what I found there. Um, so, onward. Oh, and I, I'm going to stay here because I don't have slides, and a lot of my work deals with challenging the cultural privileging of vision, and so you can think of it for that reason, although that's not. <laughs> so, uh, as the 50th anniversary of its publication draws near, Berger and Luckman's The Social Construction of Reality is um, pretty firmly established as a modern classic of sociological thinking. The book's title and the concept of social construction, which the text defined and popularized, is widely discussed in introductory courses and forms an a priori operating assumption for most sociologists, although the process of social construction is more often taken for granted than explicitly theorized. Yet at the core of the book are a number of how questions um, that ask sociologists to think about the mechanisms of the social construction process, most centrally, how does subjective reality appear to the individual as objective or independent from him or her? To quote from the opening lines of the book, the basic contentions of the argument of this book are that reality is socially constructed and that the sociology of knowledge must analyze the processes in which this occurs. When considering the mechanisms of social construction, one of the most notable aspects of Berger and Luckman's account to me is how attentive it is to the cognitive underpinnings of the social construction process. And without in any way diminishing um, the centrality of cognition to social construction, my objective today is to suggest that sensory perception is another related and critically important mechanism of social construction. And in fact, um, one can argue that cognition is fundamentally dentent on sensory perception, as Abiatars Rubavel once did. Um, a good way to begin exploring the mind he wrote in his book Social Mindscapes would be to examine the actual process by which the world enters it in the first place. The first step toward establishing a comprehensive sociology of the mind, therefore, would be to develop the sociology of perception. And, um, and indeed, currently, the sociology of perception is um, an emergent area of sociological inquiry. Uh, and it focuses on examining the sensory dimensions of the social construction of reality, including processes of sensory socialization and perceptual construction. And um, you know, it encompasses research that illustrates the sociological importance of the sense of senses that have been relatively neglected. For instance, scent. Um, it also includes studies that defamiliarize visual realities that are typically taken for granted. And and these kinds of studies, um, I should point out, are particularly powerful because they contest the unique role of sight in social interaction and its cultural elevation um, above the other senses. What Martin Jay has referred to as our cultural ocular centrism. Arguably, the most fundamental insight of a sociological understanding of sensory perception is that reality is experienced and fundamentally shaped through our senses. It's only via the senses that the world enters our minds and our experience, and sensing the world is therefore a way of building and reshaping the way the world is assembled. Yet processes of sensory perception have re received relatively scant attention in studies drawing on the fundamental sociological perspective of the so social construction of reality. But there's a lot to say about the sensory pr production of sociological phenomena in general. Um, as David Howes and Constant Klassen put it, quote, the ways in which we engage with art, in which we practice medicine, in which we experience our social roles and systems of justice, in which we manufacture and market products, and in which we make sense of the world all involve particular ways of sensing. So their suggestion, I think, is that the sociology of perception is, is perhaps um, not best understood as another subfield of the discipline, but as a perspective relevant to the study of um, any area of sociological inquiry. And I think one of the key benefits 
of using this sensory perspective to analyze sociological phenomena is that a sensory analysis is, by definition, an analysis of the social construction process, of the mechanisms of social construction. And so it reveals something about how social construction actually works. And so I'm going to take an example from my own work on the sensory construction of sex bodies, just as an illustration before I, I turn to the, to the text. So in this work, I argued that one of the key perceptual processes underlying our experienced reality is selective sensory perception which I described using the metaphor of perceptual filtration. When we see bodies as male or female, I argued we are seeing a selective or a filtered body. That is, in order to see sex, we must selectively attend a small number of sexed features and disattend the physical commonalities among human bodies. So in my analysis, I try to show that one of the key insights of the metaphor of a perceptual filter is that it brings our analytic focus not simply to our experienced perceptual realities, but to those sensory details that must be disattended in order to experience the world as we do. And the passages and blockages of the filter metaphor represent cultural norms of attention and disattention, relevance and irrelevance, highlighting the relationship between social norms and the structuring of attention on a cognitive and perceptual level. And so building on this prior work, one thread of my argument in this paper um, is that culturally organized processes of sensory attention and inattention can actually be identified in many of Berger and Luckman's points about the social construction of reality, indicating that you know, this common um, mechanism of sensory filtration may underlie the social construction process in a wide range of empirical cases and settings. So um, turning now to, to the text, I'm going to highlight um, a number of key textual moments where greater attention to perceptual construction may enhance our understanding or even provide new insights. And I, I'm specifically going to focus my discussion today on um, primary socialization, face-to-face -face interaction, language and relevance, and the dialectic of externalization, objectivation, and internalization. And, and identifying throughout um, evidence of sensory attention and disattention as mechanisms of the social construction process. And I know that sounds kind of like a lot to do in the next, I don't know, 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to be brief in my comments about each and just try to suggest the way that sensory perception might be implicated. Um, but first, I just want to point out the most explicit mention of the senses in the book, because there aren't a lot. Um, and that appears in Berger and Luckman's argument that there are few biological limits on humans' interaction with their environment. Um, and you know, what's ironic about this, their most direct discussion of sensory perception, is that it's actually um, treated as one of the small number of biological limits to the social construction process, rather than a mechanism of the social construction of reality. But what I found is that if one reads the book through a sensory lens, or with a sensory sensitization, you find implicit references to sensory perception everywhere in the book. Um, and so I'm just going to begin with, with primary socialization and um, and go from there. So <clears throat> one key piece of their argument in their discussion of primary socialization is that the process is always selective. So they write, every individual is born into an objective social structure within which he encounters the significant, significant others who are in charge of his socialization. The significant others who mediate this world to him modify it in the course of mediating it. They select aspects of it in accordance with their own location in the social structure and also by virtue of their individual biographically rooted idiosyncrasies. The social world is filtered to the individual through this double selectivity. So, um, right, we see that they use the metaphor of a filter there in precisely the same way that I'm using it to talk about sensory perception, but they're talking about the socialization process. Um, and they also argue that in addition to being selective uh, due to our emotional attachment to our significant others, primary socialization is emotionally charged, right, rather than just strictly, co strictly cognitively learned. And that helps us to have a deeper sense of identification. And I think that the point that primary socialization is selective and also that it is not strictly cognitive, um, that both of those points can be deepened within, within, with attention to the role of sensory perception in primary socialization. And so the most general point is that uh, in addition to its cognitive and emotional dimensions, primary socialization includes sensory socialization. That is, right, when we learn to identify with a social reality, we learn to see, hear, feel, and smell that reality in a similar way as the people by which we're normally surrounded. And of course, cultures differ considerably in their sensory values, right? So um, uh, we know that 
for instance, Anthony Sinnott has argued that some cultures are contact cultures, right, where touching is more common and, you know, the boundaries of personal space are different, whereas other co cultures could be considered non-contact cultures, and that's just one of many examples of cultural differences. And so not only um, does primary socialization include learning these broad social, these broad sensory values, such as being a contact culture or, in our case, an ocular-centric culture, um, it also includes learning how to appropriately use and evaluate sensory input. So we're socialized into what our culture considers to smell fragrant or bad. Um, in the case of touch, we come to discriminate between meaningful touches and meaningless touches, appropriate and inappropriate touches, um, and all, also to apply, to apply contextual meanings to empirically the same touch sensation, right, to, to understand what, what it means in context. Um, we similarly learn to attach meanings to sound as we become um, what Housing Class and have called educated listeners, and we become experts in the practices of tactful blindness, discussed by Irving Goffman. So building on Berger and Luckman's argument that primary socialization is selective then, one might argue that part of the process of <clears throat> sensory socialization is uh, a process of creating the culturally appropriate sensory selectivity. In other words, if part of primary socialization in involves learning to perceive the world through the senses, as the others around us do, the mechanism, or one mechanism, of this sensory alignment process is sensory attention and disattention. We have to learn which sensory details to pay attention to so that we can share a sensory world with our significant others, and we carry those socially learned sensory meanings into our interactions. And so turning now to interaction, um, in the text, Berger and Luckman place great emphasis on the significance of face-to-face -face interaction in the social construction of reality, and a number of their comments in this discussion invite a stronger consideration of the role of sensory perception, which is, I will argue, one of the important reasons the face-to-face -face context is distinct from other forms of interaction. And the language that they use in this section to talk about why the face-to-face -face context is unique is certainly evocative of the senses. Um, specifically of visual perception. So they write that we see, we're oriented toward the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other is simultaneously available and continuously available, the other is fully real. They also state that bodily indices such as gestures and facial expressions are, quote, continuously available, available to us in the face-to-face -face situation. And so the basic idea is that when we can see the person with whom we're interacting, they're available to us in a way that makes them seem more fully real. Uh, and this, so this suggestion of the role played by, vi by visual perception in forming the uniquely powerful reality of face-to-face -face interaction, as well as the further implication that there are varying levels of realness to our realities that may be tied to their sensory features, um, would certainly be enhanced with a consideration of something like ocular centrism or the cultural privileging of visual perception, right? Given that sensory value, the face-to-face -face context may derive some part of its feeling of being uniquely real from the cultural privileging, right, of visual perception over other forms of sensory perception. One of, um, one of Berger and Luckman's arguments throughout the book is that intersubjective reality is contingent on the existence of some guide to relevance and irrelevance. And they argue that the social structure of knowledge provides these relevant structures and that it's provided through language primarily. And so, um, right, my, this co comes back to my original observation, right, that they place great emphasis on language as a mechanism of the social construction of reality. Um, but I, I, I would argue, and I, I find in, in looking at the implicit um, discussions of sensory perception in the book, that considering the role of the senses enhances um, our understanding of um, the social structuring of relevance and irrelevance in several important ways. So first and most broadly, um, Berger and Luckman's treatment of knowledge seems just to implicitly assume that knowledge is predominantly linguistic and that, right, but we know that sensory perceptions are themselves important um, and meaningful forms of knowledge. In addition, right, this idea that the social stock of knowledge provides relevant structures through language for me raises the question of how, right, by what mechanisms does this common stock of knowledge actually shape our experienced reality? Uh, for one thing, language as a system of signs often requires sensory perception to, um, to have an effect, to enter our minds, whether through writing, reading, speaking, or listening. Um, language and therefore knowledge and the relevant, structure, relevant structures that are embedded in it is frequently made available to us um, through the senses and we frequently interact with it through the senses. Um, <clears throat> finally, one 
One important way that linguistic relevance structures our experience is through organizing our sensory perception via attention and disattention. And here again, I want to invoke those passages and blockages of the filter metaphor as a representation of these social norms of irrelevance and relevance. So my point is that what, what we understand as relevant can also be understood as what we are socially expected to attend perceptually. And what is irrelevant, right, is often what we should disattend to successfully participate in shared social reality. And so in this way, sensory perception seems to me to be an important link between language and knowledge as um, relevant structures and the experiential outcome of the process of social construction and objectified social reality. And indeed, one area where Berger and Luckman particularly emphasize the importance of knowledge and language as relevant systems is in what they refer to as the fundamental dialectic of society, right? Externalization, objectivation, and internalization. And although their emphasis there continues to be language and knowledge, if the influence of language on our experienced reality is, is as I've just suggested, entwined in a number of important ways with sensory perception, it seems important to specifically consider the role of sensory perception in this fundamental dialectic, and especially in objectivation um, as well. And so one of Berger, Berger and Luckman's core ideas, as, as we all know, is that the, objecti the objectivity of the social world is always produced by humans, no matter how obdurate or natural it may appear to be. And we experience the reality of everyday life as external to us and imposed on us from without. In, in their words, we experience, quote, patterns that seem to be independent of my apprehension of them and that impose themselves upon the latter. Um, and again, they attribute much of this sense of objectivity to language and knowledge. But I, I think that the choice of the word apprehension in the above description, right, itself serves as a reminder that there's likely a perceptual process involved. Um, Again, for one thing, the externalized world is often only known through sensory information, even as processes of perception are, of course, mediated by language. And more specifically, as I already suggested, if the influence of language is to define relevance, we often apply that relevance perceptually as selective attention and disattention. And further, as suggested in Berger and Luckman's discussion of the unique power of face-to-face -face interaction in establishing intersubjective reality, and as demonstrated by research documenting our cultural ocular centrism, visual information has disproportionately high truth status compared to the other senses, and therefore the visual in particular likely serves to strengthen objectivation and seems to play a key role there. And, and related to this, and, and this is you know, my final point about objectivation, sensory perceptions are themselves objectified, which Philip Vanini, Dennis Waskell, and Simon Gottschalk capture with the concept of somatic escalation in their recent book on sensory sociology. Sem sem somatic escalation, their term, is a naturalization of the perceptual process that results in, quote, an illusion that perception is free, is natural, sorry, and free of interpretive work. And so such objectified sensory perceptions then function as sensory indices, which are, they argue, ideal for naturalizing cultural dynamics. So in other words, when we experience external realities that are really a human creation as fixed and imposed upon us from without, this is in part um, due to our belief that what we perceive through the senses is an exact mirror of empirical reality without distortion or selection or interpretation. And as we've seen, right, our belief in the objectivity of the senses is stronger for some senses than others. And in light of this, an analysis of sensory perception, particularly visual perception, seems very important to a fuller understanding of objectivation. And I, I think, I, I've been thinking that one might actually think about objectiv objectification as in part a process of ignoring or disattending the selectivity of sensory perception. And if, and if we view it that way, by extension, one can think of a sensory analysis as a reversal of the process of objectivation, right? given that it explicitly reveals sensory selectivity. And so just um, to wrap up, Berger and Luckman's arguments in the social construction of reality place great emphasis on language, knowledge, face-to-face -face interaction, and objectivation. And what I've tried to show in this paper um, and in the larger work that it's a condensation of is that our understanding of each of these is enhanced with an analysis of the underlying sensory processes. And I've also tried to draw conceptual links between primary socialization, relevance, and objectivation by highlighting the way each involves perceptual attention and inattention. 
and just speaking more broadly, an account of sensory perception as a core mechanism of the social construction process can enhance our understanding of many of Berger and Luckman's original insights, and, and more, maybe more importantly, constitutes a renewal of their very important call to focus on the mechanisms of the social construction process. Unfortunately, in my opinion, this call has been incompletely received. Far too many sociologists begin their thinking from the premise that something is socially constructed without actually examining the underlying question of how the social construction process actually works. And so I'm therefore renewing their appeal for more examination of the underlying mechanisms of social construction, um, and, and you know, including but obviously not limited to this one part of it that I've emphasized here, selective sensory attention and inattention. 